Okay. Yo, greetings everybody. Uh, with the Pepe here, it's podcast. This is episode 122. And um, yeah, man, we're talking more power trend right today. But before we get to that, um, yeah, man, if you're new to this channel, we want to smash that like and subscribe button at the bottom there. Um, it helps the algorithm and to pick it up. And um, on that, like, um, YouTube has picked up the channel and started suggesting us that the hopes will pick up YouTube. So more likes, shares, and comments will help with that. Um, yeah, remember, guys, I'm recording this podcast with Uncle Asal Kevalan um, from Austin. Austin, Texas. We actually got a really dope as episode we're doing this coming, we're recording this coming weekend. We're talking about the politics of women's hair, what constitutes beauty and that type of thing. It's really fun. But sisters from two we got we got we got sisters from that uh, sounds it's a controversial topic. <laughs> it is I can't wait actually it was like it's something like what is beauty? Like I am my version of sister and we want to talk about braids and everything everything but what constitutes beauty. So look forward to that and just one more thing. Yeah, remember you can check us out on video platform, YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, etc. So all those channels, all those links will be at the end of will be <laughs> He's on the page to look forward to that. And um, yeah. That's it. Um, as I said earlier, we're talking right into today. I'm with my brother Mustafa Junado, all the way from DC, Northern Virginia. Um, yeah, yeah, he said it's in the same area of something or some sort. Um, my yeah, brother, yeah, so it's, a, it's kind of like, um, if you think about Joburg, Centurion, Honeydew, yeah, Brandberg, all those areas, so but I, I guess Joburg is, is the central part. But so where I live is sort of an outskirt from DC, which is the main city, but but it's considered they call it DMV, which means um, DC, Maryland, Virginia, but it's a part where those three places kind of intersect. Kind of like between if you go to northern Joburg and it's close to Pretoria and places like that. So, but I'm close. So, but most people don't know northern Virginia, but everybody knows DC where Biden and Co. Are, yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's to be that's yeah. to be cool if we can if we can get to that because I like to pick your brain about what's happening around the world. Um, I know just for yeah. my listeners, uh, we had this we had this chat on Facebook about Putin. Um, you had some pretty radical views, and we can we can get to that a bit later. I think that's some. I think that's some really. Yeah, touching. yeah, it's controversial. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd like to challenge you a little bit on that. But let's start at the beginning, my brother. So, um, oh well, yeah, you are writer. Right, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, uh, right. so tell us a little bit about you know. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Just like you know, where you're from that type of shit, and we'll just wing it from there. Okay, so yeah, so I, I am a writer. Um, I studied psychology in school, but also philosophy. Uh, did a master's, didn't finish it. That's another story, which we'll talk about later. But yeah. I did a master's in, um, actually I was done, started three masters. I did a master's at Vitz. Then I took some time off, then went back to University of Cape Town, did a master's in philosophy, then took some time off again. Then um, in the States, I did a, I started a master's in creative writing for poetry. So the theme is that, uh, connecting it is that I, I like philosophy because it's theoretical and it asks questions and it explores things. And as a poet, I'm exploring reality, but not just you know, the abstract things that you see in philosophy. With poetry, you're exploring things like emotions, trauma, and things. But it's using the same method that you would use in philosophy with the type of philosophy that I do, which is very analytical, where you take concepts and you break them down. But it's, it leads to a sort of a, not a paradox, but a contradiction, because when you think of poetry, you think about purely feeling. But from what I've seen, I'm sure you know as an artist, when you're an artist, when you're flowing, you want to be in feeling. But when you're composing you want to analyze things and break down and look at your concepts so basically i have both sides of my brain working with poetry i'm able to be philosophical and analytical but also be true to my feelings so so i can try to go on both ways i'm not i'm not comparing myself to those guys like um maybe some people like a uh, renaissance man uh, leonardo but i'm not at their level but i'm trying to do the same thing in which they're doing is to use both sides of your brain yeah to explore your emotions but to explore reality also 
and then take both sides and, and find the synthesis. So I prefer poetry because poetry allows me to be analytical when I'm looking at what I'm doing and looking at my process and looking at what I'm saying, but it also allows me to be free flowing so that I can just say it poetically and do it. And then afterwards, when I'm trying to compose, same thing with a painter or a musician, you can be critical of your work and say, okay, well, I need to look at the philosophical grounding of it or whether it's a valid idea and things like that, you know. So, so yeah, so yeah, that's, so that's my history. I've, I've done uh, philosophy, philosophical writing and poetry. I haven't been published as a poet yet, although I got into a program. Um, the name of the program is Fairly Dickinson. It's a program in New Jersey. So I, I've written things that I haven't published, but I've what I have published is one article on um, Harry Journal. Um, I think the name of the guy who does it is Kaganoff. You know Kaganoff, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he has a, a journal which is interactive. So I wrote an article on, on trap music in which I argued that trap music is basically West African style music, but within the context of inner cities in the South in the US. And so when people are attacking it, they're not understanding that it's a rhythmic art form, not just a lyrical art form. So you have to judge it by how it functions. So it functions with the lyric, the rhythm, and the feeling like blues, whereas maybe older rap like uh, guys like Biggie or Tribe Called Quest is more about just the, the lyricism and is more literary. So, so the idea is that my, my mind is like in a lot of different places, poetry, dealing with feelings, dealing with how you have life, then philosophy, writing about the foundations of reality, and then also with art and music. So I like to write about art and music, which is why I wrote about trap, but I also like to focus on um, figurative art and art in general, because I don't see any distinction between if you treat poetry as an art or if you treat um, painting as an art or you treat literature. To me, it's all the same thing, but it's different mediums, but there's different variations. So, if you have okay. a figurative painting, you may have less narrative than if you have a poem. Yeah, I'm going off the board. Yeah, so yes. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna, I was, gonna, I was, gonna, I was. Gonna, you raised, you raised a bunch of points there. Uh, uh, uh the first thing yeah. I want to raise is the, is that you as an artist trying to use both sides of the brain. Uh, I yeah, think yeah, that's, yeah. I think that's pretty fresh. Um, and you were, you were using like, um, the example of Leonardo da Vinci. I know we were taught in history books that he was like held as like this ultimate. I think there was many artists that actually did that, especially from the continent. But like what I wanna, what I wanna, what I wanna, what I wanna add on to that is um, uh, uh, just explain to us a little bit more on the the philosophy behind it, um, and exactly how you how you is it something that you is it exercises that you do is it projects that you do is it where you write. Yeah, just explain to us a little bit. How do you, oh, yeah. and what is the desired outcome of it? Okay, so, um, yeah, so the desired, this is, this stuff is so layered. So my process is that I go into what I would call rhythms or trance or train of thought or mode of feeling in which I have to say something at that point. It's usually based on things that I'm studying about and that I care about. But when I get into that poetic mode, what I do is I just flow and say, okay, this is what it is. So I, I, I do a lot of um, what you would call a stream of consciousness. So okay. that would be the best word. But I can go into any, it could be anything. It could be somebody's talking about Putin and I'd be like, okay, well, this is what Russia did. <laughs> They're this. And then once I get into that zone, things that are pertinent to that come out and then it plays itself out. So that so one of my goals is to continually do that because I see that as being sort of uh, my mode of of expression, my mode of prophecy. Where I go, I'm using the word trance, but it doesn't have to be trance. It can be stream of consciousness, any type of rhythm. But after I do that, I realize that if I want to be an artist, I have to go back to my stream of consciousness things, which a lot of people may appreciate, but a lot of people may not. So it's a lot. So, so I just use the word. It sounds sort of uh, judgmental, but I would say that a purist might appreciate what you have to say in that moment of trance or whatever, even though it's imperfect. But if you want to be reaching out to the community as a writer or an artist, then unfortunately you have to start taking craft seriously. And I think that's good because when you start taking craft seriously, you start taking things like grounding and reality which is what human beings care about. 
So to me, the, the, the most powerful type of art is, is something that can deal with the human condition. And in order to do that, unless you're really, really good, unless you've been doing it for years, kind of like a rapper who can freestyle, your freestyle things will be good. And some a lot of people can appreciate them, but they may not resonate with humanity at a broader level because they need grounding. So to me, that's what composition is. Composition is taking the work you do in a pure moment and figuring out what you can do from your scrapbook or from the things you've done to create works that have artistic impact, you know? So to me, it, it's kind of like life, it's a compromise. You have your chaotic side, your free flowing side, but you also have to respect form and even a little bit tradition and figure out where you can place your work within that perspective. So what I would like to do is to take some of the raw things that I write and rhythms and figure out what compositions I'm going to use them for and how I can make the compositions organic so that even though I'm conforming to standards of critics and other people, I'm still putting in some of the magic or spontaneity that I have. So, so that, that's basically my goal. My goal is to do compositions in um, poetry and in um, fiction writing, which are based on a chaotic method that's free flowing, but also where you have to come back and rearrange things, kind of like making a movie where you have to do your editing and things like that, you know? And sometimes, yeah. or sometimes it can just be rewriting. It doesn't even have to be editing, but I could, let's say I come up with a poem and I say, oh, this is great, but it has problems. I'll try to say it again, maybe a year later when it's clearer to me and it's spontaneous, but it's more perfect than the last one, you know, those types of things. So, yeah, so. Yeah, the well, process, yeah, so the process that I use is, is that I have a lot of, I have a scrapbook. Facebook is my scrapbook and everything. And what I do is I, within like five years, I repeat the same mantras and the same ideas, but in variations and they keep developing. And the idea when I'm doing that, the aesthetic is that I want complexity. So so if, if as a child, if I'm starting it at first, it's kind of rigid. Oh, freestyle and be complex. When you first do that, it, it doesn't look like it's normal. But if you do it over and over, then you start thinking in a complex manner when you freestyle. You know, So that's the idea. So what I want to be able to do is to write things that are, com that are complex. And so what I mean by complex is that it shows all the shades of a human being yeah, yeah, or I get reality. It. So it can't be simple. It cannot be, oh, this person is evil and he killed 55 people. And this, oh, that person is great because she saved 55 people. I want everything to be blurred so that we can see reality as it really is, which is, it's very complex. Just like with human beings, we have a part of our brain where we're lizards, where we're violent. We have a part of our brain which likes sex and even debasement, or we treat sex in a debased manner and we enjoy it. We have a part of ourselves where we put ourselves up as angels. So what I want to be able to do is have stream of conscience, which covers those things so that once the reader or the, the person observing sees it, it leaves them troubled. They're like, wow, nothing is justified. Everything is bleak, but at the same time, it's hopeful, but at the same time, it's evil. And so the idea is to have everything so that nobody leaves with any one determinant and they get to see how, how complex and how ambiguous reality is. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, you said a bunch there. So like, with the ambiguity. Yeah. I like. Um, but going I back like to your process thing. Yeah. So, sorry, one more thing. Going back to your process thing. So my process is to rehearse behaving in that way in which I'm trying to speak uh, in a complex manner. And kind of like with Shakespeare's poems, they always turn unexpectedly. Trying to do that in real time. But when you first try to do that, it's pretentious and it doesn't seem proper. But if you believe that reality is that way, the more you practice it, it then it becomes organic and people think it's just coming straight from you. You know, you know, so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. that is yeah yeah that's layered um, I mean, it's actually if I must unpack everybody layers and it take us a while uh, I like why you say like Facebook is your scrapbook um, how yeah. you uh, how you sort of interact with all your friends comments etc so you use that as a when you say that um, I also I also like what you, what you say when you say you you want the you want the, the, the reader sort of to leave with these multiple almost different scenarios they can take from the right from your, uh, from from your writing, uh, um, and leave them with, um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I guess like you know, you know, Facebook and social media is a very interactive platform. Um, you get a real sense of what people think of 
for example, artists like work, uh, writing and so forth. Oh, yeah. Uh, what do you, what is like, like, like I, like I asked this early on about, um, like, what's your, I get, I get what you're trying to, uh, get people to take from, 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 uh, from, from your writing. Um, is that your, uh, I mean, you know, you know, within within starting philosophy and so forth, is your is is your core thing writing? I mean, is is, is your core base writing? You 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 wanna you wanna be a writer, uh, um, and not a philosopher. And on top of that, uh, um, I guess these questions are not are not really related together. They don't really come together. So I think well, yeah, let's, this, let's, let's just leave the one out. out it's complicated. Well, actually, I, I want to be a the commercial side. Mm-hmm. And my phone is yeah. Buzzing, I have a quick joke, but seriously. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about yeah. that. Sorry, I cut in front of you. Yeah, I was cutting in front of you. Yeah. So um, you said yeah. So yeah, actually, you, I don't even want to be a writer. I want to be a painter, but I can't. <laughs> so I like figurative painting. I'm just joking, but and I I admire painters, and that's what I would like to do with my writing is to create imagery and visions that move people. But the only difference is that with a figurative painting there's less background narrative. It's more in the instant. Whereas the writing, you have to build up some grounding before you reach that. Yeah, man. Chameleon, that chameleon-like painting. So, but it's usually, if you look at a Shakespeare painting, it's usually at the end where he turns it around and gives somebody like a phrase that blows their mind and says, well, I don't know what to make of this phrase because I'm thinking 30 different things. So to me, that's what figurative painting does is that it captures things, but it has less of the uh, the narrative which I think that writing has as a medium. But like you said, yeah, with philosophy, so I will say, like, I'm not trying to sound like conceited, but at a level of philosophy, I've, I've mastered that because it's philosophy is very straightforward. It, it's not creative. It's just analyzing What concepts. is your philosophy on life? Oh, that's different. So yeah, so that, the word philosophy is ambiguous. So when I say philosophy, that I'm good at, what it really is, is using logic and reasoning to answer questions. But if you want to go to the to the deeper meaning of philosophy, my, my philosophy of life is that inherently it's meaningless. But that's not a problem for human beings because we are conscious beings. So by definition, to be conscious is to create meaning and value. But I don't believe that there are any valid moral judgments or valid judgments in reality other than what you say and what your value system is. So I think reality objectively is meaningless. It's amoral, morals don't come into play. It's just about survival and self-preservation, but also about looking for love, looking for friendship and things like that. But I don't think it has any higher meaning, but I do think that as human beings, we are the meaning makers. So we're kind of like God or God or goddess or whatever word you want to use. We, we are the spirit and we have a nature. And our job is to find out what our, to find out what our value system really is. You know? So a lot of times you might say your value system is this, but you could be deceiving yourself because it's not really in line with what, what your, your authentic self is. So that's the way I would look at it. So to me, morality, and meaning of life has to be based on your experiences, your environment, your genetics, what you've been taught, and what can bring you as much happiness or well-being as mm. on earth. You know, mm. and I think that what would happen is that if most human beings follow that, then we wouldn't need religion or a moral code, because if you really look at what our needs are, we need, uh, we need. As human beings, we're mammals and we're social creatures. We need social support. We need affection. We need friends. We need money. We need resilience. We need to have safe environments. So if human beings start thinking in terms of that, they'll most likely be motivated to behave in a way which is social rather than antisocial. You don't so think I don't use words like social. Some of it, but some of it is antisocial. For example, someone who says, okay, you know what? I can sacrifice my own son or my own daughter to get ahead. I'm not judging. That's an antisocial behavior. You know, it's, it's antisocial. I get you. Or I can, I get you. but 
uh, they may feel like they don't need a motivation to behave in a social way. So yeah, they can still be social and like talking to people and making negotiations, but the better word would be to be anti-social um, harmony or anti-social well-being. You know, so that so to me, the the concept of social already to me necessarily involves uh, respecting humanity and not being a predator or things like that. So that that goes again. Well, I think we can universally social. say that there's very little respect of humanity. Uh, in 2023, yeah. um, across the globe, like there's very little of that. Um, when you yeah. mentioned earlier on about um, yeah. about your about like what people, I got a, I sort of, I sort of got a sense of like um, like there's like there's a very, you know, there's all these layers, and then you to your writing, and um, how are you, how are you getting readers um to engage with your writing? How um, so so I'm yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to, I'm trying to sort Wait, of. Put uh, into the commercial uh, uh, side of it, because I sort of want to get your opinion on technology and how you're using tech and so forth, and an understanding of, of all of that. So, um, I mean, you mentioned early on about 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 Facebook and and so forth, and I mean, I see your posts, especially on on on, on all the platforms. So, how are you how are you engaging yeah. with um with readers, and do you think readers are enjoying your work, and what is it about your work that they're enjoying, and so forth? Uh, so what I do, and there's always a balance between narcissism and because as a writer, narcissism. there are different types of writers. Some people, are, are, yeah, I'll, do, I'll tell you what I mean. So a lot of writers are private about their writing. I need my, I, I like to talk. So it's not just writing. I, I like to talk. It's compulsive. I like to think, and I like people to hear me talking. So it, it helps me to have the like Facebook or Instagram, and not just talking. Sometimes I'll put my photographs, photography that I do, or, but I need people to see me doing it for me to be motivated to keep doing it. So I'm a storyteller. Uh, my granddad is from Texas. Said. He used to tell stories and he was very flamboyant. So even though I'm an introvert, I need that performative aspect of my writing. And sometimes it's to shock people, but everything I say, even if it's to shock people, I actually believe it. I wouldn't tell a lie just to be manipulative. I think reality yeah. is shocking. But the idea that I just put it out. So, and my work, probably the Facebook, it's the Facebook algorithm. It, it gravitates or it draws in people who have the same world. Mm, it's just a delay in broadcast there. So just bear with us, please. Uh, it seems like this delay is a bit more than a delay. Um, yeah, just uh, just bear with us, Will. Um, I think I'll actually just pause. Um, hey everybody, we had a break in transmission there. Uh, sorry about that. Um, but we are back now. Uh, my my brother Mustafa, you uh, you was explaining um, just before he left. Yeah, so so what I was saying, because you had asked me about um what type of listeners I'm trying to reach or my relationship yeah. with to, to the listener or the audience on Facebook. So what I do is I just put my work out into the world because it's gonna be too disappointing. I know this sounds I was trying to find something philosophical to say, but it's too disappointing if you put it out there and expect a response. So I just put it out there. And the fact that I put it out there, I know people are 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 watching it because there's a performative aspect. I, I want to be seen and heard, which is weird because introverted and social anxiety things, I have those types of things, but at the same time, a performative. I think Beyonce said that. They said she's an introvert, but she likes to perform. Also Michael Jackson. So it's a sort of weird, and I think the performance aspect is a way of breaking out of my shell. Also, I say controversial things because I think as an artist, you should say it. I've had history with alcohol and with drugs and things but i put it out there because i think that's what art is dealing with and you can't call your artist self an artist if you're concealing yourself an artist has to show themselves to be taken seriously and i think what people can learn from artists is that anything you do you should not be ashamed of it although you can say it's bad and i need to improve but you shouldn't be ashamed because i think shame leads to uh other problems and it makes trying to cover it up and it blows up. So the idea is that I put my work out there, but 
it tends to attract people who come from the same, you know, background that I have. People who it's weird because because then clearly I'm one of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the Facebook algorithm. It, to me, the Facebook <laughs> algorithm is not it's not a, it's not a fancy algorithm. The energy you put out into the world, reality will bring that energy towards you. That's the way I look at it. So. I don't have them. And I always joke because somebody will put a beautiful picture up and have 300 likes. I always tell myself, if I have eight likes on a day, that's great. Although if I have zero, I don't care. You know, the idea is I want to put out good work. And a lot of times I could have zero likes, but someone can inbox me and say, oh, I like what you wrote. And that's more important to me because I resonated with the audience that I am meant to reach. So that sounds kind of religious or uh, prophetic, but I have a voice and I put it out there and it's meant for someone. And those are the ones that I'm trying to reach and their feedback is important to me. So I I don't want to be famous. I don't want to be famous. What I want to do is to have, you know, as an artist, this is where maybe slightly narcissistic, we want validation for what we're doing. But to me, validation for what I'm doing. Really think it's, um, I don't think it's really narcissistic that the artist wants validation. I think it's part of part of like our job so to speak, because the artists are the mercy yeah. of the recognition factor. Uh, uh, we need that recognition factor to love. Um, yeah, and to it's live. Yeah, every, you're right. And it's every medium. So I yeah. don't really find it. I agree, with you. I agree with you. So to the idea then from what you're saying, what I draw from it is that if I'm an artist, I have to be relevant to a society and bring value to it. And the recognition is the feedback for the value but i think that you know as human beings as we grow along ego comes into play too oh yeah not only do i want to be validated i want everybody to say wow he's the greatest you know so that's that's sort of like a bad side effect of it but i try to focus on the good effect which is that am i valuable to my community and is my community value what i'm doing and this goes back to ancient art the shamans and the people that's how they lived. that's how they ate the society made sure they were taken care of because they provided spiritual artistic yeah, values that help society move forward. So, so I think that's social reinforcement. All human beings like praise. Although the idea of liking praise might be slightly narcissistic, but it motivates you to to do what you have, as long as you don't go overboard. But to me, what's more important is not so much getting praise. It's knowing that what I'm doing is useful and effective, which goes back to the point at which I said before, like I'll do things where I write spontaneously. And I'm like, oh, I love this. But in order for me to be serious as an artist, I have to start doing compositions and organic and and making some um, compromises or not compromises, but adjustments to reach the broader community. But I think I have something to say, which is valuable to them too. So I don't mind compromising and being less esoteric or less abstract or, but still trying to hold on to some of that type of magic, you know? So, um, yeah. you, know you know, you've been, you've been talking now for a while about your about your writing um can you give my listeners like an example like can you um can you read us a poem or uh let me see if i have something here uh i had it on my phone here um i'm trying to think about yeah i think i have some so what i'll do is i'll just go to uh let's see I have it. Yeah, this is the problem of all these devices and stuff. I should have just written it on paper. Okay, here it is. <laughs> I'm trying to think if there's anything that I have it's putting me on the spot here. Okay, let's see. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know if I have a poem. I can go to some poem that I have on, um, but let me see if I can find something here. Um, okay, so it's not so much poem, but so what happened was. Um, Sometimes I'll start off with a train of thought. So this yep. is a train of thought from, from Ursula Le Guin, who, who wrote fantasy. And it's going back to what I was speaking about earlier in which I go into trances or rhythmic states where I flow. So what she says is that poetry is rhythmic. Oh, no, this is actually what I said. Poetry is rhythmic verbal art that invokes imagery and vision that like figurative painting art is elusive and can't be interpreted in regular speech or any language other than the vision itself. So basically what I'm saying is that when you look at a painting or you look at poetry, it says something to you and you, it's a waste of time to try to interpret what it says in any other language. The painting is the language itself. But going on to that, so Ursula Guin, that brought into my mind 
where I, I associate it with something she says. And she says, prose and poetry, all art, music, dance, rise from and move with profound rhythm of our body, our being and the body and being of the world. Physicists read the universe as a great range of vibrations of rhythms. Art follows and expresses those rhythms. Once we get the beat, the right beat, our ideas and our words dance to it, the round dance that everybody can join. And then I am thou, and the barriers are down for a while. So what I'm taking from this is that you get into that elevated mode and you have something to say. And to me, it's pointless to say, I'm going to write a poem. No, you don't say I'm going to write a poem. You actually receive that rhythm at that moment, whether you're a painter or a writer, and then you flow with yeah. it. So I'm trying to see. So, and I, so I, what I do is I, I have notes here, but to me, all my notes are associated. So this is an activity that I'm doing. So what I wrote here, writing solves other problems like fear and suffering. You know, so that's the idea where I believe that, um, you know, it sounds like a cliche, but I, I, a lot of artists will say art is trying to solve problems. I mean, you know, sometimes it may solve a problem, but the solution may be just irony or cynicism. It could be anything. The solution doesn't mean that you're going to be happy. But the idea, so I, then I wrote a list of things. Know I your aesthetic. <laughs> yeah. What's that? I love, oh, about, I love um, the solution won't always make you happy. It can be cynicism. Yeah, yeah. Or it can be. That's that. Yeah. Fucking... To me, irony, I, irony to me is that's the aesthetic that I love. Irony because irony, like we're living in a world in which uh, this is this is how bad it really is. Russia is fighting Ukraine, and Ukrainians and Russians are dying. But what the sad part is that we know about that, but we're not talking about Yemen. We're not talking about Somalia. We're not talking about people who are getting killed in um, who are getting killed in Colombia. We're not talking about Palestine. We're talking, and also Palestine. I'm sad about what's happening with Ukraine, but the idea is that, yeah, what's happening with Palestine and um, Israel, to me, that's really bad, but we're folks, so the idea, but what's really bad about the situation is that what's happening with Russia and Ukraine is bad, but if you think that's bad, what's even worse is that it's happening all over the world and nobody talks about it. So, so the idea is that when you think about the world as it really exists, how most of us exist, I think that irony is the, is the, and this is just my view, not everybody's, is the strongest form of artistic expression because it has a solution which doesn't say things are going to be okay. It's just a sort of nuanced attitude towards the way things are, you know, and that, that's the, uh, the can, solution. Which goes back to the thing where I talk about. Complaint. I think it's very yeah. naive to think that yeah. everything is okay. And I think it's the artist's job yeah. uh, to sort of, sort of, to sort of educate um, 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 everybody about that. Mm -hmm. Because everything won't be okay. Yeah. But regardless of the outcome. Yeah. And I think yeah. And but I think that the, the paradox is that everything won't be okay. But what the artist does is that they find ways of being when it's not okay. And to me, that's what the blues is. Like the, the for art form started by, you know, Africans brought to the US. It's not gonna be okay over here. But we created a very powerful art form. Then we created hip hop. And same thing, so it's not going to be okay for a lot of those guys on the streets, but they, they yeah, yeah. Um, What's that? Um, yeah, man, yeah, man, let's take it. Um, 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 let me get your perspective on a few, um, on a few other points, um, um, that I think is sort of relevant. Uh, you mentioned, you mentioned earlier on, or, or rather, or rather, let me make the point that, like, I totally understand where you, uh, where you've positioned yourself and as a writer and, um, what the writing is about. Yeah. Stop, excuse me. I got flame in the back of my throat. Um, what your writing is about, um, 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 and and you know, and all and different layers and themes and so forth. Um, clearly, you got like a whole bunch of influences behind um, behind everything, and 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 um, um, I'm taking a, I'm putting this out on my backside here, but like I get a sense of like 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 you also using your writing as a as a tool. And Fela and and Fela Kuti was was famous for saying that that the music is a weapon. So, give me your perspective yeah, sure. on um, on um, you you mentioned like Ukraine um, and, and so forth. I mean, but there's conflict all over the world. So so I'm not I don't really you know does it it could be it, it could be anything. There's also some crazy shit happening in DC right now at yeah. the, at, at the moment. Yeah. Give me your perspectives on like 
where uh what are or rather we say the phrase like this is there something specific globally or locally that you are um that's affecting you personally that you are writing about and um if so you know you know what type of emotions what type of themes and what you know what's your opinion um about it through your writing of course yeah so several things so like with my um i'll try to make it i don't want to get too too long-winded but so let, i'll start with poetry and fiction so what i focus on is because i've been involved with um substance i've never been like a hardcore criminal but i've been involved with taking substances it showed me a side of the me world too, bro. Which, uh, i took substances yeah. before we i took substances before oh, we started to talk. cocaine <laughs> cocaine cat hard stuff really hard stuff and um it disrupted my life which is why i wasn't able to finish my master's. and i've gotten into three master's programs i'm not trying to brag but i have a pretty high aptitude for things i've gotten into three programs and had to stop and i was getting good grades but just because i couldn't function i couldn't show up to class and things like that so it's put me far back i'm 49 years old i could be far ahead of life than i am now but I in that world I saw people who were trafficked females, kids who were trafficked, and were using people who were abused. And I also saw hardcore psychopaths. And one thing that I take from all of that is that each person that I saw was complex. And uh, uh, it's my job as an artist to give a portrait to them and a portrait to me and i'm no different from them even though i haven't done the crimes that they did but going on that's the way i see the world so the world has a problem right now especially with uh the global south african nations south america black people in the u.s i consider black people in the u.s as part of the global south even though they live yeah. in the u.s in which we are subject to predation and in which we do drugs or we become pimps or we become uh dealers or we become assassins because that's the way society white supremacy has that's the role that they've created for us and we've internalized it and we've actually turned it into a normalcy which is what i want to look at in my art we've turned it into a normalcy to look at how you function normally if you're a junkie or if you're a i've seen this a lot people who are uh ladies who go to clubs and say and hang out with guys they really work for dealers and say, oh, let's get high together and stuff like that. And they're basically trafficked. And a lot of times they can run away if they want to, but they don't because they've internalized the value of that lifestyle because it starts with them when they're young. So that's what I see in the world. But aside from that, the rush, the war between Russia and um, Ukraine is actually, as far as I'm concerned, a war between the U.S. and Russia, which started in after World War II in which Europe had to take the background. Germany was beaten. Britain needed the US to help it. And Russia, Russia lost 27 million people to beat Germany. So now the, the big kids on the block were Russia and US. But the US chose the route of continuing neo-colonialism. Whereas Russia, and when I say this, I don't want to sound as if I'm saying Russia is a good country. But I think they were smart enough to know that they need to invest in world development so that they can make the West look bad. So for example, Mozambique, Angola, South Africa, it was the Soviet Union who gave them arms. It's because of the Soviet Union. And I always thank the Soviet Union for this, even though I don't agree with, I'm not, I'm not pro-Soviet Union. If not for the Soviet Union, we wouldn't have Cuba, which is the most socialistic country in the world today. It has, point. Cuba has, has a higher um, education rate than, um, yeah, man higher life expectancy and better yeah, educational man. standards. Yeah. Now, whether we like Russia or not, we have to admit that if not for the Soviet Union, Cuba wouldn't exist because that's where they got their funding. But my argument is that is the Soviet Union is not altruistic. They are just strategic. China and Russia need the world to be stable so that they can peddle their goods and their manufacturing. So they, they're doing it for strategic reasons. And I believe they saw this day coming where there would be coups in Nigeria. There was a coup in Gabon yesterday and yeah. people are raising Russian flag. Yeah. So they so in other words, they were just smart, they were smart businessmen by loyalty from everybody rather than trying to be colonial, which is what I think the US tries to do. So now so now what I see now is that African nations, 
we lost Gaddafi. Also, I'm not a Gaddafi fan. We lost Gaddafi. We lost Lumumba. We lost our leaders. We're not sovereign and we're not able to develop our resources. So now we have to enter trade with Russia and China. There's no other way because unless we have our own currency and we tried to do that and they killed Gaddafi. So my argument is that a lot of people tell me that I'm just a, just like a colonialist. I'm worshiping China and Russia. No, what we have to do is hold our resources and trade with them and make sure that we're not um, what's your, or, what's and they're going to try to your think on BRICS? On the um on the BRICS block because well, BRICS that in the essence is what you as what you were saying is is you know they're looking to trade and yeah. so forth and so forth and hold a bank yeah. and currency. So to so me, BRICS, yeah, and well, and see, here's the thing. So BRICS is the opposite of um the IMF system. So BRICS wants money to be based on industrialization and resources. IMF wants money to be based on finance and debt and spending money on wars and things. BRICS wants to deal with resources. And it makes sense to me because it has the most resources in the world. And BRICS will, will come out in Russia's favor. Their money will be stronger than anyone's because they have commodities. But at the same time, African nations have commodities and BRICS allows an alternative around the US dollar. So we don't have to be slaves to the dollar. And it, the China, I, say, I always say the Chinese and the Russians are smart. I don't know what their end game is. You have to be suspicious of them. But they've already said, like with South Africa, if South Africa wants to trade with China, China will take South African rand. If you're a South African, that's good news. That's good news. Whether, yeah. you, whether you hate China or Russia, that's good news because yeah. it means you don't devalue your money. Yeah. So to me, the bigger question is, the bigger question is, after South Africa now uses the RAND to trade with China and Russia, what is South Africa going to do internally? What are we going to do with the revenue? I said we, because I mean, I lived there for five years, seven years, so I always say we, but what, is, what, are, what are we going to do? Because to me, I'm an African, so and I always tell people, Nigeria, I'm from Nigeria, but Nigeria is in my black book now because they refuse to step away from IMF and they even threatened to attack Niger, another African country, which has been subjugated by France. But anyway, the idea that South Africa, the problem is not how South Africa trades with China or Russia, it's what are they going to do internally? Are you going to nationalize the resources and make sure that all your kids go to school? Are you going to address uh, South Africa, gender based violence? I don't yeah, think it's the internal. government so is. Um, 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 interesting. Uh, you have some you you raising some you raising some interesting points there, and um, you know I don't really want to debate the the, the actual points because I'm not a politician, oh, yeah. and this isn't a political okay. uh, you know platform. However, can I interject I just, real quick? Pardon? Let me just interject real quick. I agree with people. We shouldn't trust China and Russia. Okay, but I'm speaking logically. As long as we don't have. Um, productive capabilities and things, and we don't have our own currency, we have no other choice but to trade with other countries. But I feel oh, sure. we shouldn't do that. I feel sure. we shouldn't, we don't need to trade. We have enough resources so that we don't need to trade with the world. So but yeah, let's move on. Yeah. So I, I think I would agree uh, with you. I'm skeptical of this also. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but just the, it's, just it's, the point it's the best that. option right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I also, you know, you know, from, from, from what I've been seeing, it is a, it is probably a, the only other option we have um, in South Africa, we have this goddamn electricity crisis, and uh, I think any any South African who's in, will take money or resources from anybody who wants to help us with regards to that. And um, I think, like on the continent, um, most people have just fed up of the West because you don't have to be a politician to understand what they did to, and I'm talking the entire continent. You don't. You don't even have to oh. be uh, politically woke to to to. You can see it every single day. You see it. You love it every single day. And I think it's there. Um, and in so, I think that's also kind of dangerous in a way because, um, you know, if you're sort of desperate, you'll just take help from anybody. And me, I don't trust the Chinese for shit. I don't. Trust we don't need them. to. I don't, don't trust. Don't I don't trust it. the Indians. Uh, but, I mean, Bolsonaro was, is, is, is gone now. I mean, Lula is there and this and that. But I, I mean, nobody in the history of the continent, nobody has ever been good to Africa, ever. 
what no, no. get something no, but, that but, but, can but I would us. I would go back to the fact that the Soviet Union did give um, ANC and groups. But sure, was, but look what the but look what the, the ANC into. They knew they knew what they were doing. Yeah. Nobody, nobody has these countries don't don't give a shit. I think it was you know it was Biko and said black men we want you own. Yeah. black yeah. men we are our own. And, like these guys don't love us, man. Right. And that's just how it is. And, and the biggest challenge for us now is if we're going to be sovereign and not deal with any of these countries, we have to revamp our education system because you can't produce and take care of your own country if you don't have scientists, social oh, workers, yeah. doctors, oh, yeah. engineers, and we're going to crack. So now that's going to be a big challenge because we're so far behind. We're so far behind from years of colonialism. Yeah. And and exploitation. So China and Russia are, are exploiting African nations. They're just doing oh, yeah. it in a in a way that doesn't violate them as bad as France and Congo. Not Congo, I said Congo. France and um Belgium. Yeah. Belgium, Belgium is really British. bad. And all these guys like Rhodes, who a whole Don't university is named that. Yeah, the British. Um, yeah. Oh, the British the are the British kings. Is yeah. 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 It's just that the British they, Oh, they're, they're, they're the worst. But they're sneaky, though, because they use more subtle forms of violence, whereas, like, the, 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 the not the Dutch, but the Belgian were like, oh, we'll cut off your arms. But what the British will do is is infiltrate your country with your own people. Well, one of the, think, like, let, me, let, me, um, yeah. let me tell you this point about the British, where, where I think they are really smart. I'm talking to you right now in their language. In English. Right in now, English. I'm talking to you yeah. in, in, in their language. Like, how much power is that? I... On this on this podcast, I mean, I've recorded a bit over a hundred and just think under hundred forty episodes, um, um, you know, in, in general, and every single one I did in English, and I use um some uh, I don't know if one of the cell phone networks is linked to to a British company, and I don't yep. want to get into that, but I use some mm-hmm. form of British product and their language, and we're using their law, their laws and their religion. Okay, me, I and I'm, even their concept. Yeah. I think yeah. Gnostic, yeah. so like fuck religion, but 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 yeah. that doesn't. Um, most of my guests are. Yeah, that's not bad about my. I think that's power. Don't talk bad about my Sangoma. I was joking. I said, don't talk bad about my Sangoma, man. I'm just kidding, but no, but yeah, but here's the thing. Not only that, think about it. What's the most powerful language in the world right now? English. English What's the most bro. powerful currency? What's the most powerful the currency? The U.S. dollar. America is an extension of Britain. So English and the US dollar. And that's what's making the world come together. Like I said, enemies come together. I always have a joke. All right, boys, we're going to join China. Then when America's gone, we're going to attack China. You know, so the idea is all the people are dealing with the bully right now. Hmm. So they're coming together. China, because even China uh, and Russia. About, are talking not... about a bully. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me get your opinion on, um, on Trump. He's making serious headways over there. I've been asking a lot of my oh, American Trump? comrades and friends about, like, yeah. is there a civil war coming? Is there, you know, like, how concerned are Americans? What's your, what's your, what's your take on all these indictments and the forthcoming elections in next year? Um, the indictments are politically motivated. They're, they want their, to do their best to, to take Trump out of the game. That's a personal thing between them, because Trump is part of the elite, but I think they realize he's not part of their deep state. So I'm not saying Trump is a good person, but he's he's. This is like having a. This is kind of like Caesar versus the senators in Rome. Caesar's not a good person. Rome senators aren't good, but they have to get rid of Julius Caesar. So they have to get rid of Trump because he's a megalomaniac, and he's not for their cult. That's the way I look at it. He's not for their cult. He's for his cult, and he's charismatic, and he has a following which will follow him him to hell if if he tells his followers to jump into the water to go to hell they'll do it because he makes them feel heard and appreciated and going back to what you said i find it almost impossible to believe that the u.s could have a civil war but it looks like the u.s will have what i would call a hybrid civil war the u.s is made up of the elite in new york and dc who are they call them new englanders they are very smart very fashionable they have etiquette then the south the rednecks, the people who are down to earth, a little bit supposedly more racist, because to me, they're all racist. But the Southerners are more uh, 
like Philistines, they they lack sort of like uh, the same sort of polish and they're yeah, more open with their big, big bigotry. So yeah, this abortion thing is a perfect example. In the US now, states don't listen to the federal government. They follow their state mandate. So the federal government said something about uh, abortion and the state government, and I think it's Ohio, they said, oh, we don't have to listen to the federal government because our state government has its own constitution. So this is going back to a civil war, but it's not gonna be like people shooting and killing each other. It's gonna to lead to like things like with uh, when they tried to overtake the US, January 6th where Trump's supporters tried to uh, overtake the White House, even, even though it was overblown. So what you will see is more civil disobedience in the US. Also the US has 300 million guns. So the average American is armed. And so my view is that they'll stop paying taxes and they'll tell the government, we're going to do what we want. And if you don't like it, come on here and try to make us not do it. And the government will leave them. So the U.S. is going to fracture. And that's what's going to lead to the destruction of the U.S. empire is internal politics. They're spending billions on Ukraine, spending trillions on wars, giving Israel money. But they're not, adjust, they're not addressing the social divide between gay and religion. So I'm on the side... I'm, not, I'm on the side of gay rights and gender rights as against religion, but there's also a divide on economics. The southern part of the country wants agriculture and an economy that's based on productivity, whereas places like New York are just based on finance and advertising, which doesn't work. So the U.S. is a country that's going to, which is unbelievable because it has more resources than just about any country. It's going to collapse based on social issues. We have have in the U.S. you have people who go to grocery stores and shoot black people, or people who go to a school with an AK-47 and shoot 60 children. And the politicians don't want to restrict guns because the gun companies uh, lobby them. So in short, the U.S. is sacrificing its kids at the altar of bow. It's sacrificing life. It's human sacrifice. It's the same thing that you see in Aztec Mexico, where people would kill and give it to the sun god. The US is based on sacrificing everything to corporations and has led to a social divide and it's gonna lead to a civil war, either a real civil war or a, a hybrid civil war in which the country still exists, but it doesn't function. And that's what that's really what China and the rest of them want. And they're gonna sit down and watch us do it. That's what I believe. Yes, sir. That's, that's actually but quite I think scary. Africa, we're in the middle ground now. Yeah, I think right now Africa is, we can go either way. Most African nations, South Africa can, if, if they're able to socialize their resources. I don't know what you think about Malema. I think Malema is a, he, based on what he says, he's he probably, the, to me, my favorite politician. I don't like him, but he has the best vision based on who I see coming Julius, out of South um, Africa. Julius, it, Malema, uh, 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 Julius yeah. Malema knows how to deal with the media better than any politician, I think, post-democracy in yeah. South Africa. Um, I mean, he knows oh, yeah, the yeah. media, uh, uh, and he knows what to say and how to say it. Um, I think yeah. his politics, to me, I don't trust a single politician ever. So I'm the wrong person yeah. to ask about any politician. But, well, however, I, I do think idea, like yeah. in next year's election, they most probably, most probably got the potential of being the second, second biggest, uh, yeah. you know, my, official My prediction is that which is, within 15 years, yeah. within 15 years, EFF will be the most powerful uh, uh, party in I South think, Africa. I think that's and, not far off. Um, that's yeah. not that's not far off. Um, and um, to be honest with you, in 15 years, I'll probably have the same conversation with with artists from all over work about about the government because I don't think politics is the answer. My brother Mustafa Jinado, no, no. uh, Viking. Um, we had a let's actually wrap it up over there, man. We we covered a bunch of things. Like much respect to yeah. to um um. I appreciate um. I guess like the honesty in how you and how you talk about. I think um, I think how you engage in social media, it fascinates me, man. Um, 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 I think I think your 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 style of writing was fascinating. Um, I mean, and I also interpret it in different ways. So it was really dope to sort of to sort of get it, you know, from your perspective. Um, just as in closing, my yeah. brother, can you give my listeners any um, like uh, social media handles? Um, you know, if people want to reach out to view more of your work and that type yeah. of thing. Yeah, if you go to um, on Facebook, it's uh, Mustafa Janado, um, M-U-S-T-A-P-H-A, 
and then Janadu, J-I-N-A-D-U. So they can find me there. I wish I had copied them. Then I'm also on Instagram. And if you go there, you'll see, like I said, it's everything. You'll see politics. You'll see painting. You'll see ideas. You'll see trolling. You'll even see things which I don't believe, which I'm going to make people get angry, just to agitate people. So it's very, uh, so, you know, Instagram, just Mustafa Janadu, M-U-S-T-A-P-H-A. J-I-N-A-D-U. And also, I want to say thank you to you for giving me a voice, and thank you to you for what you are doing for the... No, I'm serious. I've been following you. What you're doing for the our community of um, African and African thank diaspora. You, and, Bless uh, it. And, and what you're doing is important. And I hope that you continue growing, because you, you more people should be tuning into your podcast. It's very valuable. Blessed, my king. Yeah. Blessed, my king. Yeah. Blessed, my king. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, let's wrap uh, it thank up. Thank you very much. Listeners. Blessed, yeah, my yeah. king. Um, to my listeners, if you are still new to this channel and you got so far, remember to smash that like and subscribe button and help this uh, algorithm grow. Mustafa Ginado, I don't know you said in the chat you got to work pretty soon. Um, so let me not keep you up. Yeah. It's um, unfortunately. It's, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, yeah, your days between minus envy. Um, I'm about to join and have some supper and then work on this podcast. My king, much love. I'll be. I'll, I'll let you know via social media when we publish pop publish this episode it should be in about seven days time up and until then my king thank keep you well and thanks for the love, love. one okay, love thank you one love, one love. All right.